Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks again for joining us. My name is Dan Dunsky. I'm the executive producer of The Agenda with Steve Pakin. And uh, welcome back to another of our regular uh, chats, uh, Agenda Plus chats on international affairs. Joining us from her office in downtown Toronto is Janice Stein, the director for, of the uh, Monk School of Global Affairs. Say hello, Janice. Hello, Dan. Very glad to be with you again. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. Uh, Janice, uh, we're, we're already, we've already got some people chiming in, so we'll get to those questions th that they have in just a couple of, couple of minutes. But I suppose with uh, an election just having happened, or excuse me, a referendum in Egypt just having happened on the weekend, ongoing uh, turmoil, what seems to be the, uh, the end, end game in Syria, I suppose those are two stories that you're keeping uh, that's, uh, th that are taking a lot of your time right now. Uh, that's certainly true, Dan. Beyond um, what happened uh, in the United States, of course, in Connecticut, uh, I am really paying attention to the referendum in Egypt. We're only through the first round, uh, so it's not over. Uh, the second story that's interesting, of course, is the South China Sea, where tensions are boiling and bubbling. Uh, between China and Japan. There was just an election in Japan uh, that seems to have brought to power a government uh, that campaigned on being tougher on China. But one of the first things their new prime minister said is, we must find a way to live with China. And maybe that's the, the New Year's aphorism. We must find a way to live with China. That's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting point. I, I I should have mentioned the the election of the apparent election of Shinzo Abe, and the uh, the Liberal Democrats. Uh, are you surprised at how quickly relations relations between Japan and China have never been historically and certainly not since the Second World War been? You couldn't ca characterize them as close. But are you surprised at how quickly we've seen a deterioration in the relationship between those two powers? Surprise is probably too strong a word, Dan. Um, I think what's top of mind is that this was leadership transition time all over Asia. Uh, in China, we had the once in a decade transition, and there was such a long run up to it that it's extremely difficult uh, for any prime minister or president uh, not to play a nationalist card. We had the election in Japan which again, uh, you, you saw what we call outbidding, where people were competing to be tougher uh, than the next guy on China. We have an election in South Korea uh, that is going on, where many of the same issues are on the table. So you almost have a circle of elections going on around the South China Sea, and it's usually under those conditions that you get the kind of real uptick in tension that we're seeing now. But there is something deeper here, and that is, of course, that the Chinese are becoming a major power. They're on the verge of becoming a blue water navy, which means their ships can venture far beyond uh, their own coastline. And the South China Sea is, as far as China is concerned, their backyard. It's a, it's a really good, it's a good point that you make about the blue water navy. Um, but against that, I, it, it, still, it seems to me that China still has a, is following a policy of peaceful rise. No trouble with the neighbors. And yet, in the past two years, what we've seen, uh, to my mind, are, are, are a number of countries that are taking steps to balance themselves against China regionally, uh, some of which involve the United States. But that would seem to fly in the face of a peaceful rise. In other words, do they trust China's intentions to rise peacefully? So those are two separate questions, really. Is China rising peacefully? That's one question. And secondly, do neighbors trust China to rise peacefully? Certainly what we're seeing, I can give you a clear answer to the second, no, uh, they don't. Uh, there's real nervousness in capitals like Tokyo, which as you rightly said, uh, have had a history of very bad relations with China. Uh, we're also celebrating the anniversary of the Japanese invasion of Manchuria and the rape of Nanjing, which are bitter, bitter memories in China of Japanese occupation. 
Uh, the South Koreans are extremely nervous, not only about North Korea, but about China's support of North Korea. Uh, it, all through the neighborhood, the, the Vietnamese, uh, are, are, they're all looking at China growing at such a fast rate, developing a more muscular military capability, and you're getting exactly what you described, which is a banding together. Um, of neighbors uh, who do not want a confrontation with China. That is not what they want. And they don't want the United States to be in the face of China, but they want the United States to be over the horizon, ready, uh, in case China really begins to flex those military muscles. One last question, on, on unless we get something from one of our viewers, because I do see that there's a question that has come in from Peter on Syria. But let me just ask you one final question. What do you make of the North Korean rocket launch, uh, the, the, excuse me, the satellite launch, which, according to reports this morning, the, the satellite seems to be dead. Uh, but what do you make of that, uh, of the launch? Provocative act? It is uh, because uh, there was, in fact, an understanding that had been reached with the government of North Korea that they would not launch um, vehicles, however you want to describe these, into space and into orbit. Uh, they have done that, and they've done that really uh, to strengthen the new leadership, uh, to celebrate the grandson, to clearly mark a demarcation. This, for unfortunately for him, is the second try. The first rocket failed to launch. Right. This satellite was orbited into space, was certainly supposed to last longer. Uh, that a brief period that it has lasted, you're right, it is apparently dead. So in a paradoxical way, yes, provocative act, but for those who are most alarmed by North Korea's military capability, somewhat reassuring, given the technical difficulties that they're having and that they're visibly having as far as the rest of the world is concerned. Nevertheless, it does seem that they were able to put a, a three-stage rocket into... Wow. Uh, into orbit. Into orbit, and that's quite something. Okay, our first question, Janice, comes from Peter, and he asks, uh, moving us to the Middle East, given the benefit of hindsight, was there a credible opposition in Syria that the West could have supported that would not have led to an al-Qaeda influence in Syria should Bashar al-Assad fall? That's a really good question, uh, because that's that makes me roll back history, roll back the tapes of history. So we're speculating here, but my hunch is uh, that there really was not. Not because there were not um, a series of centrist groups uh, that rose in rebellion against the al-Assad regime, uh, but because once that process of rebellion began, Saudi Arabia and Qatar we're going to get in the game. They have big interests uh, in separating Syria from Iran. They're, particularly Saudi Arabia is highly motivated to do so. And their funding was always going to go to a more Islamic element. So even if the West had come in earlier, I don't think there was any way of preventing uh, a more militant opposition who are seasoned fighters, by the way, much more experienced than urban dwellers who rise in revolt. Um, this, the, the emergence of at least a significant component um, of militant Islamic fighters was inevitable. Well, that leads nicely to a second question. I'm just going to lean forward so I can read it. Um, and this one is that uh, says, we have not heard much detail about the opposition. Uh, which seems to be fragmented. Would um, this and this this uh, this guest would like a better understanding of who might replace the current regime? Um, I suppose it's not if it falls, but increasingly it looks more and more like when it falls. Well, you know, I've been saying now, and of course you're go I'm going to be right sooner or later. I've been saying for two years it's going to fall, but don't try to pin me down on the when. Uh, yes. Uh, but it does look like the regime is increasingly in trouble and the time is now short uh, rather than long. As to who's going to replace uh, the government, no one yet knows. There is now a more a, a officially united opposition um, that was forged in the last 10 days. 
there is a president, uh, there is a candidate prime minister, but I have very little confidence that people who currently hold these offices will survive a transition. Uh, normally what happens in these kinds of circumstances is that the fighters on the ground uh, enact their power out of the barrel of a gun, as Mao Zedong once said, and I don't think it will be any different in Syria. It's very possible that we could have a, a civil war uh, after the al-Assad regime goes. How the regime goes is really going to matter. Is it going to go to our white country in and around Latakia? Will there, in fact, be fighting because there's still a majority Sunni population in that part of the country? What happens to the army? What happens to the bureaucracy? The army is Alawite officered. Uh, does it survive the transition? It's the facts on the ground which are going to matter rather than the way an opposition that is still outside the country uh, organizes itself. Janice, how, how, will the, how will the Assad regime fall? What will actually happen that we will be able to point to and say, this is the day that the Assad regime is no more? It, I think that will come when uh, the al-Assad family, when Bashir al-Assad, his wife, his children, his uncles, small group, larger group, actually leave the city of Damascus. Now, do they leave to go to northern Syria? Uh, where they attempt to form a small Alawite state. That's certainly a credible possibility, and there's some signs on the ground that that, in fact, could be their fallback plan. Uh, do they leave the country uh, you know, in a last-minute attempt to negotiate asylum? Uh, maybe in Russia, that is not uh, beyond the, you know, the realm of possibility. Or um, do the fighters gradually encircle um, their headquarters in Damascus, and does it end in a bloody gunfight uh, where al Assad is killed? But what is required is that he willingly or unwillingly leave the city of Damascus for the regime to fall. So Damascus is the prize for the fighters. Absolutely, absolutely. And what you're seeing now, then, is you're seeing the fighters closing in uh, around the suburbs of Damascus. Uh, and and the, the real question is, are they able to hold those suburbs against artillery fire from, from the government? And increasingly we're seeing that they can. That's why there's a sense that the end is not far off. Uh, we're not talking a year any longer. Um, I, I noticed this morning that uh, uh, reports that Russia has sent a couple of warships into the Mediterranean. Should it become necessary to evacuate Russian citizens from Syria, of which my understanding are they're dating back to when Syria was an important Cold War ally uh, of Russia. There are several tens of thousands of Russians living in Syria. How would that kind of evacuation take place? So there are tens of thousands of Russians, but there's, there are many, many who have married Syrians um, and actually would not probably not want to leave. Uh, they've been in Syria for 30 years. You know, it's interesting, historically, the last time we had um, a Russian evacuation was just before the outbreak of the October War. The Russians sent war shop, warships to pull out people from Syria and Egypt. And both of those governments were furious because this was a surprise attack and that was considered an absolutely telling indicator that war was going to start. So I look at this now as a telling indicator. The Russians are now persuaded that the al-Assad government is finished. Uh, it's over. It's just a question of when. Who do they want out first? Well, who they want out first are their advisors because they have boots on the ground uh, working with Syrian forces. They have intelligence agents that are working in the country. So they have a significant presence of what I would call Russian operators, and they want those people out first, long before they want uh, Russians who've been living in Syria for 30 years, who have Syrian husbands or Syrian wives, as it may be. Uh, their target is on their own people who are working on behalf of the government. That's very interesting. Okay, question three from Jason keeps it in Syria uh, and asks, uh, Syria matters a great deal to Iran. Mm -hmm. How is Iran viewing the current situation there? And I suppose 
to just keep it going with, uh, to be more specific to what we've just been discussing, how does Iran view a potential fall of the Assad regime? It's a defeat for Iran. Um, Syria was their only real ally uh, in the Arab heartland. Uh, this was a way, of course, for Iran uh, to outflank the other Sunni Arab governments, uh, number one. Number two, to supply Hezbollah, and that, is a, that was a key strategic advantage. Janice, sorry, just take a second there and explain how the map works so that people can understand how Iran could use Syria to funnel arms to Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. That's right, because if you look at uh, Iran, which is on the Persian Gulf, if you're Iranian, or you know, the, the Arabian Gulf, if you're Saudi Arabia, uh, so you cross the Gulf and then keep going, uh, and you get to Iraq, and then keep going, and you get to Jordan, and just to the north of Jordan is Syria, and then just when then you're at the coast virtually, and you're at Lebanon. Hezbollah is in Lebanon, so f at the other extreme, really. Iraq far to the right, far to my right, Lebanon far to my left. All of southern Lebanon is Shia. This is the largest Shia population outside Iran in the Middle East. And Hezbollah, uh, which is the Shia militia, um, has been supported, sustained, armed, financed by Iran for more than two decades now. If it loses that capacity to, by sea or by air, ship equipment into Syria, which then moves overland easily into Lebanon to supply Hezbollah, it will be very, very difficult for Iran uh, to continue to provide that pipeline of weapons, which is absolutely essential for Hezbollah's survival. So that is a huge, huge problem for Iran. Now, what's Iran doing about it? It is already positioning itself for the post-Assad uh, era. It is reaching out uh, to some of the militias who are fighting on the ground, not the Al-Qaeda-inspired ones, because those are Sunni, uh, who have very little time for Shia in Iran, but to the more moderate ones, uh, seeking to provide assistance, support, uh, to begin to make friends, uh, among the resistance so that when that moment comes that the al-Assad regime is over, uh, Iran does not find itself totally cut out of the picture. My own view is they are going to have a very hard time, frankly. Um, this will, there will be a Sunni government uh, in Syria when this is over, of one kind or another, and I'm very doubtful that that Sunni government is going to look uh, with favor on Iran, nor is it going to look with favor on Hezbollah, which is currently now stationed in Syria. It has training and placements in Syria, especially around the chemical weapons sites. And that's a whole other story. But it is in the, the successor government in Syria is not going to look well on Hezbollah. So it's a, it's a, it's a strategic defeat for Iran. Um, you know, we, we've, we do have a question that is going to move us to Egypt, but before I go there, I would like to ask you, what do you make of these warnings about chemical weapons that we've heard now uh, for the past couple of weeks? Are, are, is there a real concern that the Assad regime may use chemical weapons to stay in power, or does this serve some other purpose? Well, I can under well understand why the general public is going to be uh, dubious, skeptical of announcements about chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction given the history of this last decade. But I actually think we're getting fairly pointed intelligence information, very specific activity done. You know with chemical weapons uh, that the component parts are kept separate. And in order to activate these weapons, you you have to take your two funnels or more pour them into the same can, take a paint stick, and stir them around, mix them together in order to get an activated chemical weapon. That's what the intelligence communities were picking up. Everybody, uh, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well, that preliminary steps were taken to mix these components together, which would then lead to the activation of the weapons. So you have to ask yourself, why? Well, one argument is that they could be used in the final stages of, of a fight. 
Um, I doubt it um, personally because chemical weapons are not precise. If you're going to use them in Damascus, you're going to kill as many Alawites as you will kill Sunnis. Uh, I would be very, very surprised if Assad went to that degree. It, it can also be a signal to the United States and to other powers uh, by uh, Assad and those who support him uh, who may feel that they are thinking about intervention in, the, in this final stage and that's a warning. Uh, do not intervene. Keep back. Stay out. And my own hunch, and I have no reliable information, this is just a guess, my own guess is that it's much more of the second than it's the first. Is there a, a, what, what are the plans, by the way, just as long as we're on chemical weapons, what, what could outside powers do, or could they do anything, I suppose I should ask, to secure those stocks and prevent them from actually falling into hands of, well, these non-state actors that are now encircling Damascus, for instance? The, there are plans. Um, the Jordanian government has been getting assistance from the United States to prepare for this eventuality. The government of Israel has plans. The government of the United States has plans. Uh, but the options actually are fairly limited. And I have no doubt, by the way, that were there to be additional inform intelligence information, that this mixing process was continuing, it's died down, it seems to have halted. But were there to be intelligence information that the mixing process is continuing, um, that these plants would be executed. So what does that really mean? You cannot bomb these plants from the air. Right. Yeah, you bomb them from the air, you release toxic chemicals across a very wide swath of territory in very unpredictable ways. Uh, so what you're going to, what will have to happen, is that you will have to have special operations forces actually go in. Uh, the sites are well known. There's a large number of them. Uh, they're not two or three. There are large numbers of these sites, which makes it more difficult. Uh, but special operations forces will have to go in, secure these sites, uh, remove the chemical weapons, uh, and withdraw. So that's uh, um, not an easy activity and one that certainly risks casualties on the part of the forces that would go in. Makes me wonder if uh, maybe those Russian warships, if that's another reason that uh, they might be approaching uh, the coast of Syria right now, but that's another, that's pure speculation on my part as well. There is, it is, but it's really interesting speculation because I've always thought that the, the country that is best positioned to secure these chemical weapons and to actually remove them would be the Russians since they already have special operations forces present on the ground and they know exactly where these chemical weapons sites are. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, Terence asks Janice, in Egypt the results of the vote on the new constitution are being hotly contested. Where do you see this dispute going? So just to make it clear to, to Terence and to everybody else really, we've been through round one. Uh, of the referendum in Alexandria and Cairo, which are the two most urban, largest urban centers in Egypt. So the no forces will do best in this first round. Uh, it now goes out to the rural areas and the countryside next Saturday, uh, where the Brotherhood is far stronger than it is in the cities. Uh, and so the count uh, is about 56, 57 percent in favor, 43 against. That's a really stunningly close result. Uh, when you look at the last parliamentary elections, where between the Brotherhood and the Salafist party, Al Noor, you had 75 percent voting for Islamist parties. Uh, to get a result like this tells us that there is significant disenchantment with President Morsi and with the Brotherhood. Now, I have no doubt this referendum will pass. The vote will be most strongly in favor uh, next week when the rural vote comes in. But if you're President Morsi, you, you have to look at this. You have to be chastened. Uh, you have to be worrying about the parliamentary elections that will be coming very shortly in the next two months once the Constitution is passed. Uh, and I suspect that the Brotherhood certainly will lose seats in Parliament as a result of the way Morsi has handled this. Um, 
And the Salafists, which draw much more heavily from the rural areas, probably less so. Uh, but this has to be a sobering moment for the Egyptian president. Um, I, I don't know how cynical you want to be, but do you suspect that the Egyptian military has decided that the new game in town, or ha, ha, has made a calculation that the new game in town will, in effect, be the Muslim Brotherhood for the foreseeable future, and uh, therefore we should not expect the the military to take any steps to um, to help uh, those who are opposed to the constitution. I think the military made a deal with the Brotherhood last August. Uh, if you look at the details of this constitution then they're really interesting. Fundamentally, they enshrine all the privileges that the military has historically un enjoyed under Mubarak. The biggest one, there is no civilian oversight of the military. Um, so that gives the military virtually everything they want. Their economic privileges, they are significant owners of uh, big parts of the Egyptian economy that cannot be touched if there's no civilian oversight. So all those people who spoke last summer of a deal between the Ikhwan, the Brotherhood, and the military, um, they appear to have been right. Uh, to the credit of the military, however, the Egyptian military has not played a political role at any point in this whole struggle. They, under Mubarak, they did not intervene pro, uh, they did not fire on demonstrators. Uh, they simply, their, their senior officers simply urged Mubarak to resign when it became evident that he had totally lost all support. Uh, but unlike armies in Yemen, in, in Bahrain, in Syria, they refused to fire on the Egyptian public. They are still not doing that. They are unwilling to do that. So when, you, when it was most tense in Cairo, what they did was position tanks between the presidential palace and the crowd, but never once fired a shot, frankly. Um, Janice, we have uh, probably going to wrap things up fairly soon. We have a long question. I did just want to mention that uh, on the Agenda's website, uh, viewers who are interested could find a uh, chat just like this that our producer Alison Buck and Terrell did la late last week with two Egyptian women uh, talking about yeah. their concerns for the, uh, the referendum. And that took place just before the vote. Nevertheless, uh, having anticipated exactly the result that you just discussed, uh, a very interesting conversation. Uh, okay, question from Edgar, and bear with me, Janice, because this one's a little long, and I'm going to read it as I go here. Uh, if the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is a friend to Palestine's Hamas, a group that is considered moderate, mind you, uh, uh, compared to other radical militia groups in Palestine, I am keen to know what efforts are being taken to secure and prevent serious chemical weapons going into the hands of radical groups, since it may be a proxy of the Muslim Brotherhood in a conflict. President Morsi has an inclination to become a more relevant and instrumental regional player, not a sentiment shared by Iran. Professor Stein, how worried should the Middle East, Israel, and the rest of the world be at this moment? That's a long question. Um, the, I think what we need to understand here is that the Egyptian state and the Egyptian military are really deeply embedded institutions in Egypt. Uh, regardless of the politics that's going on at any moment in time. I think there is virtually no possibility that the Egyptian military uh, would deliberately leak chemical or biological weapons to anybody uh, in the region. Uh, they, they wouldn't do so, one, because it would uh, really, in a sense, compromise their professionalism and the Egyptian military is a very proud institution. But beyond that, uh, were they to do that, they would not have a great deal of confidence that those weapons actually could not be turned at some point uh, against Egyptians, against Bedouin and Sinai. So it's almost inconceivable to me that regardless of the closeness of the relationship between President Morsi and the Brotherhood on the one hand and Hamas on the other, that the military, it would have to be the military that would do this, would deliberately leak weapons. Is there a possibility of an accidental leak, an inadvertent leak? 
much less so in Egypt. Uh, I think where the real problem is right now is in Syria. As the state loses control of outlying areas, there are chemical weapons sites in some of the outlying areas. That's where there is a real possibility that chemical weapons could leak um, to militias, to non-state actors. And that is what is keeping governments in the Middle East awake at night right now. That is what is worrying the United States. That's what's worrying Britain. That's worrying Russia. Uh, because the Russians too have fears with respect to their own Muslim population inside uh, Russia. Uh, and that's the big one, I think. Okay. Uh, Janice, um, I think we're going to leave it there. We've taken quite a few questions. And uh, thanks very much for your contributions. It's a pleasure. Uh, that's Janice Stein, the director of the uh, Monk School of Global Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Janice, and thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. We'll see you next time.